Episode 1 of this series began with the statement, This is a series about stories. It's a series about individual stories of people who have helped to build the Navy into what it is today. The stories are about those who have invented, fought, lived, and died, and thus have become part of the Navy's narrative. So it seems fitting that today, we look at an object whose sole purpose is to tell part of the long Navy story. Last week, we talked about the global and historical impact of the Great White Fleet, and we looked at the beautiful and ornate chair and desk set given to one of the captains of the Great White Fleet by the Dowager Empress of China. The Great White Fleet embodied much of what the Navy has been to the United States for the past 200 years, and our object today tells the story of that fleet. In general, the American vision of our Navy has been as a tool of power projection, diplomacy, and quite often, friendship and camaraderie. This scrapbook that we look at today documents this vision as it played out across a journey of 43,000 miles, six continents, 20 cities, and 14 months. The owner of the scrapbook has long since been forgotten by most history books. But he knew that this was a story for the ages, and he took the time and care to document it for posterity. Today, we take a look at the trip he so thoroughly chronicled. A special thanks also to the Naval History and Heritage Command, whose archival history and photos of the fleet's voyage this episode especially relied on. Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Bryan, Head of Special Collections and Archives and Archivist at the U.S. Naval Academy. And we're in Special Collections and Archives to look at the scrapbook of Theodore Wright Richards, who was a surgeon on the battleship Kansas when that vessel participated in the Atlantic Fleet's Around the World Cruise between 1907 and 1909, commonly referred to as the Cruise of the Great White Fleet. Great White Fleet, of course, because these ships were painted white. Theodore Roosevelt had sent the ships around the world on a goodwill tour. It also helped project American naval power. And so we have a scrapbook collected by this man who served on the battleship, and it contains a variety of documents, invitations, uh, newspaper clippings, photographs, and some documents that were issued during the cruise. Tickets, things that people keep as mementos of, of where they visited and what they did. And of course, this was a two-year event. And you can see we have a souvenir of the visit of the American fleet to New Zealand. And can turn that around. Scrapbooks are something of conservation nightmare for special collections librarians and archivists because of the different materials that the items themselves are, are and then they're pasted into these volumes that sometimes the paper is not so, so great. But anyway, this gives you a sense of what this particular person found important and obviously he probably put this together after he returned from the cruise because I think that would be a little bit difficult to do on the ship, although he may have done so. but. He obviously was interested in making a record of this voyage. Up until the time the fleet departed, there was significant doubt that the Great White Fleet would actually get underway or accomplish its mission. And, like today, a budget debate loomed large. Senator Eugene Hale from Maine, chairman of the Naval Appropriations Committee, apparently threatened to withhold money for the cruise. However, with funds already having been allocated, President Roosevelt simply dared Congress to try and get it back. The fleet departed Hampton Roads, Virginia 
on December 16, 1907, and proceeded to circumnavigate South America. The first visit of the voyage was in Trinidad, and the ships then continued on to Brazil, Chile, Peru, and Mexico before finally moving north to California. While on their South American leg, the fleet crossed the line for the first time. In a tradition that continues today, when a ship crosses the equator, the sailors are initiated into the ranks of King Neptune and his court, becoming shellbacks. Dutifully, all crew members of the 16-ship fleet were initiated into the ranks of the underwater god. The voyage around the Straits of Magellan at the tip of South America was looked upon with trepidation by some members of the public and even some newspapers who took up this angst. The now defunct Sacramento Union wrote that the fleet would likely be shipwrecked and its men eaten by cannibals. Perhaps it's due to reporting like this that led the newspaper to struggle during the 20th century, even though Mark Twain had written for it in the previous one. Nevertheless, a Chilean cruiser led the fleet through the straits safely, shipwreck and cannibal free, and the fleet then turned back north, arriving in California in May of 1908. California was a whirlwind of parties, events, and parades. The coastal cities of California competed for the opportunity to host the fleet and the next three months were spent in a constant atmosphere of revelry and merrymaking. Everywhere they went, the fleet was pampered and honored. Perhaps reluctantly, the fleet departed the California coast in July for Hawaii, and would then continue on a lengthy tour of Australia. While in Australia, the celebrations continued, leading to one humorous anecdote logged in the archives of the Naval History and Heritage Command. With all this celebrating, some of the crewmen were beginning to feel the wear and tear. One sailor was found asleep on a bench in one of Sydney's parks. Not wishing to be disturbed, he posted a sign above his head, which read, Yes, I am delighted with the Australian people. Yes, I think your park is the finest in the world. And then concluded, I am very tired and would like to go to sleep. Being truly hospitable, Sydney let him sleep. The voyage then went on to the Philippines, then Japan, where the fleet was welcomed and the diplomatic tensions that had plagued the U.S.-Japan relationship eased. While en route to Japan, the fleet passed through a legendary typhoon. Photographic evidence shows that the waves were so large that nearly the entire outline of the fleet ships would be hidden by waves. However, the fleet made it through without incident. After Japan, the fleet split, with eight ships heading back to the Philippines for gunnery practice and the other half to Amoy, China, where the captains of the ships were gifted with the table and chairs we discussed last week. The ships later rendezvoused and together passed through the Indian Ocean and then the Suez Canal. In the Mediterranean, they split up to visit various ports before returning home together across the Atlantic for a welcome in the pouring rain by President Roosevelt on February 22, 1908, in Hampton Roads, where the fleet had set out from 14 months earlier. The trip had been a spectacular diplomatic and strategic success, and the sailors who accompanied it carried with them memories from their once-in-a-lifetime trip, many recorded in our object today.